powerless. And maybe this morning you're feeling powerless about something. Even more important, when we were powerless, messed up with sin, Christ died for the ungodly. And he died to give you freedom. He died that you do, are not enveloped in worry and anxiety, even though you are facing Jericho sometimes. But our declaration today is this, really simple. God's timing is perfect. Do we believe that? Yes. Well, let's declare it like the men and women of Jericho in their shout, shall we? Let's declare it really loudly to ourselves and to one another after... Th no, well, no, we'll just say it. Ready? Go. God's timing is perfect. Brilliant. Okay, we're going to bring around the buckets of generosity. I could make a pun, couldn't I? God's timing. The buckets of generosity are coming round. And uh, let's just honour him. Okay, thanks, Katie.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me.
God of the impossible that takes the most difficult of situations and you turn the ashes into glory, that you turn oh, 
the most difficult of circumstances to the most beautiful of things. And God, we come to you this morning with all those challenges and difficulties that we might be facing and say, here we are, God, will you transform this situation? God, we want to see your transformative power at work in our lives, God. Would you meet with us today? Amen. 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 Fab, thank you. Thank you, team. Um, that was brilliant. Do you want to take your seats? So as Dot's already said, um, we've, come to, <laughs> we've come to the point in our journey through the book of Joshua where we have arrived at the city of Canaan. So, um, city of Canaan, city of Jericho, in the land of Canaan. So the Israelites and Joshua and the people, they've just walked into the promised land and they're met with this city, this huge fortified walled city, very much standing in their way. And Am I glad that um, Dot read through that whole passage before to save me a job? So there you are. You get to listen to me for five minutes less because of that. Meaning we can just dig right on in there. If you were around our 11 a.m. service last week, you'll have seen the fab retelling of this story um, with the virtual Sunday school team. Um, so if you were there, you get, you know, you're double privileged and you get a double head start on where we're going today. So let's pick up right from the beginning then. So verse 1 in Joshua chapter 6, it says and tells us that the city was securely barred. So Jericho is very much expecting Israel to attack. They're right on the edge of the city. They know that Israel are wanting through that way. They're expecting them to attack, so the city is securely barred. And archaeology tells us that this is a fortified city. It was like the defensive marvel of its time. Apparently, it had walls that were 13 foot high and 6 foot deep and watchtowers that are 28 foot tall. I don't know how exactly they know this, but I trust that archaeologists know a little bit more than I do. But either way, it's, you know, it's quite something, and it's very much in Israel's way. And yet God's promise to Israel is really clear here. Verse 2 says, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. And it's so much more than a promise of something great that God is about to do, as great as that would be. God's saying he's already done it. This is past tense. I have delivered Jericho. I've already done it. The victory's already won. The land belongs to you. Just as we, as Christians, can be sure that the victory's already won for us through the cross and resurrection, right? As followers of Jesus, we can be, we can be certain that our inheritance is secure. This, this inheritance we have of eternity and relationship with God that isn't for, you know, heaven. It isn't for way out in the future. It starts in the here and now. That's our inheritance. That's our promise. And it's certain. It's secure. The victory is done. So in many senses, right, we don't fight for victory, we fight from a place of victory. It's done. He's already done. He's already won the victory. We're just the outworking of that. We're fighting from that place. Because if you live in the same world as I do, you'll know that the challenges and the difficulties, the pain and suffering and injustice we see all around us, those very much continue, right? And we experience them in our lives. You may, I mean, Joshua, God tells Joshua the victory's won, but he's standing there looking at these huge walls towering above him. And it, it's a difficult situation, isn't it? Yes, the victory's won. Yes, the, our inheritance is secure, but the battle isn't over. We're still working, still fighting. Through, um, through Jesus' death and his resurrection, yes, death is defeated. So, so God rules and reigns on high, right? He reigns on earth. So the kingdom of God has arrived, right? So the kingdom is literally the place that the king has, has power over. So the kingdom of God has arrived on earth since Jesus' death and resurrection. Are you with me so far? Okay. So the kingdom is here, and we see the outworking of that, right? We see glimpses of that. We experience God's power and God moving through our lives, and we see, you know, miracles and, and these little glimpses of kingdom. And yet we hold this intention somehow with the pain and the suffering and the injustice that continues. So the kingdom's here, but it's not entirely. It's now, but it's not yet. We see it in part, but we won't experience the fullness, the, the completion of that until Jesus returns. And we, we have to hold these things in tension, that it's now and not yet, that the victory's won, but the suffering continues. And it's, it's a tricky place to be, and I wonder if, well, for me, one of the, the most helpful ways to kind of wrap my head around this is to liken it to the difference between D-Day and VE Day. So in the Second World War, the Allied forces won the war on D-Day. The Battle of Normandy, historians agree that's when the war was won, that's when victory was achieved. But it still took a year after that 
for Germany to surrender and for the war to be over, for victory to be fully realized and fully complete. So it's as if we're living in this in-between time. D-Day's past, but we've not got to VE Day yet. Victory's won, but we've not seen the fullness of that play out yet. So I wonder, while we're living in this strange and difficult in-between bit, what can we learn from this story of Joshua and Israel facing the city of Jericho? When they're in a very similar situation, right? God has said to them, Jericho's yours. And yet they're stood facing the walls. What can we learn? Um, about how, I guess, we, how do we see those walls come down? How do we step further into the fullness of all that God has promised us and provided for us? Because he has promised us life in the full, right? John 10.10 10 says, I've come that you may have life and life in all its fullness. That's not a promise for heaven. That's a promise for now that we experience the fullness of God's kingdom, the fullness of, of life and relationship with him in the here and now. And yet we hold that intention with the fallen world we live in and the fallen people we are, even though the victories won. So what can, we, what can we learn then about how we overcome, how we push through and see those walls come down? And I guess as we look at God's plan that he lays out in this story where Israel is facing Jericho, we see a plan that rests on both God's power at work, but also God's people partnering with him. It's a plan that rests on power and partnership together, not one or the other. So we're going to whiz through and have a quick look at some of those things um, and a couple of other things as well that I guess maybe gives us a glimpse into how, how do we as God's people position ourselves to, to see victory in our lives. So let's think about power then. You don't need me to tell you that God's power is very much at work in this situation. It's obvious, isn't it? This is a miraculous event. People marching and shouting and blowing trumpets does not usually lead to big walls coming down physical walls coming down. It's, it's not the normal or natural result. It's, it's very much God at work. And it's a, it's a bizarre plan, actually, if we think about it. It's, it's odd, it's strange. Um, and yet Joshua chooses to put his faith in this strange-sounding plan of God rather than all the, the military tactics of men that I'm sure his, you know, his advisors and peop other people in the army must have been advising him, encouraging him. And yet he chooses to trust the plan of God because he knew that the instruction of God carries power. Luke 1, chapter, no, verse even, 37 says, Not one promise from God is empty of power. Nothing is impossible with God. How he must have known that. And this is far from the only story, if we've read much of the Bible, where we see that God's instruction can seem so nonsensical to us. It doesn't make sense. It seems just plain bizarre. When you've got, you've got Abraham, who's told that he's going to be the father of this great na nation, have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. And yet God says to him, go and sacrifice your one and only son. You've got, you've got people like Noah, who's told to go and build this, this massive boat, and yet he lives in the middle of the de desert, miles from sea. You've got David, who's told to, to go face d uh, Goliath, the giant, rather than well, the soldiers with their, what's the word? Armor, thank you. Armor and all their training. But no, it's David, the little shepherd boy that has to go. God's plan and God's instruction does not make sense to us. And yet, if you know the end to any of those stories, you know there's power in God's instruction. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, tell us that my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. How true is that? If you've read much of the Bible, you know that to very much be the case. And that's what we see play out here in the story of, of the Jericho walls coming down. And the interesting thing about this story and all those others that we've just mentioned in the Bible is that they all involve people, right? God's method is very much to partner with us. He could do it on his own. He's God after all, right? He could do it on his own, and yet he chooses to invite us to partner with him. He chooses to, to limit himself, actually, to involve us. Why? I guess that's where we grow, isn't it? That's where we grow in faith. That's where we grow in trust. That's where we grow in that relationship with God. That's where we grow in obedience. Ultimately, God wants to know, will we trust him? There was... Um, a missionary back in the 1800s called James Hudson Taylor who, who served God on the mission field in, in China mainly. And he said that there's three ways to serve God. He said, you can make the best plans you can 
and hope you succeed. Okay. You, number two is you can make your plans and then ask God to bless them. Maybe that's a little bit better. And the third of all, he said, you can ask God his plans. Do as he tells you and expect the blessings to overflow. I know which one I'd rather be doing. Not always easy, but I think the message is clear, isn't it? What, there's one way to serve God that actually means we see the breakthrough, we see the blessings overflow in our lives. Are we creating and following our own plans or are we seeking and enacting God's? What would we do to see breakthrough? If we want to see those blessings overflow, if we want to actually step into our, our inheritance that God has provided and promised us, that's right there for us to take now, if we want to see those walls fall in our lives and barriers come down, we need to be partnering with God. He invites us to partner with him. And I guess that looks like two things, I think, as we, as we read this passage. I think it looks like obedient faith and courageous obedience. So obedient faith then. Hebrews chapter 11 talks loads about faith, and it actually says in verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army marched around them for seven days. And it also tells us what faith is, helpfully, in verse one. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So it's by faith and this confident assurance that the walls of Jericho fell. Great. But actually, it's more than that, right? It's got to be more than a faith of the, of the mind and the heart, a faith of thoughts for the walls to fall. It's actually when they put faith into action, when there's a, a visible outworking of that faith that things happen, that God moves. Faith that, that is linked with obedience, obedient faith. But obedience isn't easy, right? I guess for the Israelites, they, they look pretty foolish and they risk, they risk looking foolish as they walk those, um, around the Jericho walls day after day. I wonder if maybe they've got people from Jericho over the walls shouting down at them, taunting them, ridiculing them because they look pretty silly right now. Maybe they feel a little bit silly too as they walk day after day, not quite seeing God's plan come, come yet. And I don't know about you, but it's so easy, isn't it, sometimes to get so concerned with how we're perceived and, and what it looks like. Maybe it's just me, but I know sometimes I can get so in my head about coming across as like the crazy Christian or something. And maybe that's silly, and maybe it is just me, but maybe that's something maybe you can relate to a little bit too. You know, obedience takes courage, doesn't it? Stepping out for God takes courage. And for the people of Israel, it goes so much further than looking a bit silly. There's a very real threat here that by walking around Jericho's walls day after day, they're not just risking looking silly, they're, they're very much risking their lives here. They're making themselves vulnerable to attack. Each day as they march, being a little bit more vulnerable. That takes courage, doesn't it? To see and to know the very real risks right in front of us and yet keep continuing in obedience with God anyway. When obedience made them feel vulnerable, they trusted God to protect them. Their trust and dependencies on God. You know, they walked around these walls 13 times, right? So once a day for the first six days, seven times on day number seven. So they very much saw the difficulty. They saw the walls for what they were. They saw them towering above them and the, the seeming impossibility of the situation they're in. And I imagine they felt pretty small, pretty, pretty helpless at points. I think, actually, it's in that place of helplessness, isn't it, that we have a choice. We can stay in that place of helplessness, of having a, a defeatist mindset, or actually we can make a choice to shift our perspective when we're in that place, because helpless can, if we let it, move us to dependency on God. Because what other choices do we have in that situation where there's the, an impossible situation before, we either see that it is impossible, or we see the challenge of our situation, but we see that our God is bigger than that. It's a shift in perspective to be had. There's, we need to get a God perspective, don't we? The, um, Charles Spurgeon, the famous uh, preacher from, but, you know, I think it was back in the 1800s. I might be wrong, but I think so. Um, he said this in one of his preaches about the walls and the fall of Jericho. He said, they had the difficulty, I say, always before them, yet they kept on in simple faith going around the city. Sometimes we get into the habit of shutting our eyes to difficulty. That will not do. Faith is not a fool. Faith does not shut her eyes to difficulty and then run ahead foremost against a brick wall. Never. Faith sees the difficulty, surveys it all, and then she says, by my God, I will leap over a wall. And over the wall she goes. 
Faith sees and knows the challenges, but faith sees and knows how big our God is. But when we're, when we're in the thick of life's troubles, right, let's be honest, it's, it's so easy to, to lose sight of that perspective, isn't it? It's so easy to, to be back in that place where we feel powerless, where we feel helpless. It's there more than ever that we need to see we need to shift our perspective. We need to come back to God and remind ourselves that he is bigger than any challenge before us. Remind ourselves that he is this, you know, the unchanging, ever faithful God of the impossible. In fact, you don't need me to tell you that to do that, we need to come back to knowing him, don't we? We need to come back to time with him. And it always comes back to this. Everything always comes back to this. If we don't know him, if we don't have time with him, how do we know that he is who he says he is? So how can we put our faith in that and that lead us to these courageous, bold, obedient steps? We've got to know him. It's about being in his presence. And the people of Israel, they knew that. As we read um, this story, and we see... Um, that they took the Ark of the Lord around with them, right? The Ark of the Covenant. Israel have the faith and perspective to see their task, but see how big their God is because God was right there with them. I know Dot explained a little bit about what the Ark of the Lord was a couple of weeks ago, but just to remind you, it's, it's literally the presence of God, right? It's, it's this um, gold-covered wooden box that back in this time in history literally was the presence of God. It was the dwelling place of God's presence. So by Israel taking this into the battle, walking around the walls of Jericho with the Ark of the Lord, they are symbolically and literally at this time taking the presence of God with them. God is right there in the fight with them. This isn't a situation where God is instructing them, go and walk around these walls and you'll see the city fall. But actually, and then Israel sort of going off and doing it themselves. No, God is right there with them, in it all, through it all. Because it's when we take God into our battles and into our daily lives and allow him into every area of our life that we see change, isn't it? Breakthroughs found in his presence. It's as we spend time with him and really get to know him that, that our wills align so that we can walk in obedience and that we want to walk in obedience, right? It's as we get to know him that our perspective shifts so that we can take those courageous steps. And ultimately, I guess some of it is just maybe about making space. As we spend time in his presence, we make space for God in his power to move. Who knows that sometimes we're so busy running around doing it ourselves. Maybe sometimes we just, it just comes back to making a bit of space. So we have talked very briefly, and I mean, there's, there's so much in this passage that, you know, we, we'd be here all day if we tried to unpick it all. So just whizzing through a few bits that you can, you can take and you can go and ponder. So we've talked a bit about, about prioritizing God's presence. We've talked about um, shifting our perspective. We've talked about walking in partnership with him, that courageous, obedient faith. But what about if you're doing that, right? What if you are doing that and living that day in, day out? but still those walls will stay standing and they are very much in your way. They walked around the walls 13 times over seven days, right? I imagine for you know, the first few days, they're feeling pretty, pretty excited, pretty hopeful. Isn't it great to be a part of this? What's God, God gonna do? There's, a, there's an energy in, in the people of Israel. But what about by day five or six? Maybe some of them are getting a little bit tired feeling a little bit helpless, wondering, is it all nonsense? Maybe even being tempted to quit. And there will likely be people in this room that, that feel like you're in that place right now, where you are tired and it is, it is hard clinging on to the promises of God that you thought and you hoped you'd see fulfilled by now. You thought you'd be living in that by now. Yes, victory is achieved, but you've not seen the reality and the fullness of that play out in your life just yet. Isn't it interesting that our declaration today was that, I've forgotten the exact words, but that God's timing is perfect. You know, there's, there's, and we see that in this story, don't we? That um, Joshua tells the people, don't shout until I tell you to. It's all about God's timing. And, and if you're anything like me, you'll find that one of the most difficult things that you don't get to know what God's timing is and that you have to wait and you have to rely on God and that you don't know this thing. It is hard, but we can take real encouragement from, well, from Hebrews chapter 12, verses one to three. It's a verse you'll probably already know, but it says this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. 
Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Keep going. Run with perseverance. Keep running. Keep fighting. Persevere in faith. Persevere in obedience. Persevere in praise. You know, this is God urging us and telling us, just keep going. Maybe you're doing it all, but just keep going because his timing is right. And we just got to keep going, haven't we? And I imagine if actually if I was in that place and someone's telling me this, I'd find that really like, really frustrating because I want to know that we don't get to know God's timing. We trust in him, but keep going. I also want to just mention um, that part of that verse in Hebrews 12 says, Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. When Israel have, have seen the walls of Jericho fall and they go into the city and they take the city, they're commanded to devote everything by destroying it and burning it. Because you see, if they left the city standing, that would be a very real threat to them, both in terms of a, a military threat from, the, from the, uh, Jericho's armies, but also in terms of influence. The, the people of Jericho were seen as a, a wicked, idolatrous people at this time. And if they were to, to continue living alongside Israel, they threatened to pull them away. They threatened to change things and to get in the way of Israel's relationship um, and devotion to God, right? Everything had to be devoted to God. Every threat to pull them away, to distract them, has to be destroyed. And I wonder, isn't, isn't that what this verse in Hebrews is saying to us here? That God so wants us to be devoted to him, to throw off everything that distracts us, everything that pulls us away, everything that threatens to get away in, in the way of our devotion to God. I wonder if there are things that are getting in the way of us living in the, the fullness of, of all that God has for us, this inheritance he has for us. I wonder if there comes a point where we've got to get really honest with ourselves, isn't there? That actually, what does devotion for me look like? Because we say to God, you know, God, have it all, take everything. Every part of my life is devoted to you. Except this, I'll just keep this little relationship over here. I'm not going to give you that. Or, you know, I'll sacrifice it all, I'll give everything to you. Except this habit, that bit I won't change. And I wonder if we've got to get honest with ourselves, haven't we? What does devotion look like? What kind of devotion does God call us to today? Run with perseverance. Throw off everything that hinders. Because when it comes to facing the Jericho walls and after they've, they've taken the city, everything had to be devoted to God one way or the, another, right? They burned the city, and yet they spared Rahab. Rahab, I know you spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, but we, we learn in Joshua chapter 2 that Rahab, um, she was obedient to God. She wasn't an Israelite person, but she, she recognized that the God of Israel was the one true God, and she acted for him by hiding um, the spies of Israel when they came to, to check out the city. So burn the city and yet spare Rahab. And we have this, this really interesting contrast, I guess, between judgment and salvation and maybe on, on first reading that kind of feels like a little bit of a contradiction is, is Rahab the, the exception to the rule or something? No because actually everything is devoted to God one way or another Rahab chose to act in accordance with God's will, she chose to devote herself to God, everything else had to be devoted by other means, by destruction and maybe it feels really um well, it does feel really harsh, doesn't it? When we, when we read that in 2024, that you know, God's commanded people to, to, to devote everything by destruction and by burning, and it doesn't always sit quite well with us. And yes, maybe that, some of that is because these are very, very different times to the ones we live in. But maybe some of that is that actually we just got to pay attention to that it does feel harsh, but that's because it's so important to God that it's so important to God that we are fully devoted to him, that we're allowing nothing to get in the way of our relationship with him. Because he's got, he's got this inheritance, this land, the fullness of all that he has for us right there in front of us. And it's like he's willing us, come on, just take it. Just get rid of all this stuff. Just walk into it. Because actually we talk about these walls and the walls of Jericho walls in our own life, but maybe some of them were actually more in control of than we'd let ourselves believe. And we don't like to think about that. But maybe there's choices to be made here. We, um, I'll just recap and we'll just, we'll just um, 
wrap up, I think, because I want to, I guess, give us space to, to maybe think about what that means for our own lives and to respond a bit. So if the worship team do want to wander their way back up here, that would be great. Because God has very much won the victory. But if you live in the same world I do, you'll see that we have definitely not seen the fullness of that play out yet, have we? This world we live in is a hard world to live in. We're still fighting. We're fighting from that place of victory. And yet, we can't just sit, sit back and let it play out and, and be, be passive in this. God invites us and he calls us to partner with him, to take those courageous, obedient steps, to put our faith into action. I wonder what he's asking you to do today. I wonder what obedience looks like for you. And maybe that's something really specific. Maybe it's something that sounds a little bit odd, just like marching around these walls with trumpets did to the people of Israel. Maybe it's about getting back into the presence of God. Maybe it's about throwing off those things that actually, if you got really honest with yourself, you'll know that they're a problem. Maybe it's about shifting that perspective and taking an active step to, to move from a place of, of defeatism to a place of dependency on God. Maybe it's just keeping on, as hard as it is, just keeping on going. We are going to sing again. We're going to sing our final song. Um, well, I think our final song, I've absolutely no idea, but we're going to sing. Um, and I just want to invite you to respond to God in your own way. We've got the prayer um, ministry team who are going to, if you come and sort of linger around this side by the cross, they would be more than happy to pray with you. Maybe you just want to feel that nudge from God to respond in your heart this morning, to make some changes, to, to come before him afresh, because we want to see those walls come down, don't we? I wonder if you will, if you'll stand with me. God, this world is a hard world to live in sometimes and we see injustice and suffering and hurt play out before our very eyes and we experience that in our lives. And God, we need you in this. We can't see these walls come down without you. God, we need an act of, of your mighty power to bring some of this stuff down. God, we also recognize that there's a part for us to play in that too. Would you meet with us this morning and just bring us to the place where we know what is it you're asking us to do, Jesus? And thank you that you are a God of the impossible, that nothing is too big, nothing is too hard for you.
not lose sight of the Holy Spirit right now. That little nudge, maybe a big nudge. Guys, I think we all need to listen to that again. There was so much power so beautifully and gently poured into our life just in the last half an hour. Don't run away from what God is saying to you. What about that perspective shift? From being a defeatist to a dependent on God. What about the need to prioritize God's presence in our lives? What about the courage if we're in that waiting season? Where's our devotion? Where is our devotion really? Lorna mentioned two things, habits and relationships. What about our obedience? Is there something we've got to sort out? before God what is really really interesting in the story of the Israelites they were told as Lorna's rightly pointed out to be totally devoted to God if you read on in the book of Joshua some of them didn't do what God had asked in that moment they kept some of the the prophets, if you like, of the battle, the victory to themselves. And they got truly, truly caught out later down the line in their story because of it. We need to be totally, totally devoted to him. I'm going to ask the team to sing that song again. It's new to us. You know, it should be our victory cry. It should be a cry from our heart. And I want to say to us, encourage us all, challenge us is that what we really mean I want more of you God because I'm absolutely sure that every single one of us will have to go out that door to put a change into our lives I know I've got to to respond to be that action to what God has said this morning Spirit come. If you need prayer, the team are out here. Don't waste this moment. That, that you don't have to tell them what it is. Just ask them to pray for you.
This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes, I will send an army against Babylon, forcing the Babylons to flee in those ships they are so proud of. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned, their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my people, my chosen people, can be refreshed. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us today. Thank you, Lord, for your promises to us today and your reassurances to us today. Lord God, we, we want to smile because you are amazing. You know exactly what's going on in our lives. You know exactly what we need. You know the timing for any resolutions, and Lord God, we can trust you 100%. Every word and every promise you will fulfill for those that love and trust you. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's a good promise to end on, isn't it? That's a great promise to end on. The team, I've got another song. They'll sing it if you feel. We have got time. Let's do. Let's sing. Let's just go out praising. I can't remember which one it is. Who am I? Oh, great stuff. Let's go out with this one. And if you need to get a coffee, go and grab a coffee. That's fine.
Fantastic. As you go through this week, you can say that. I'm a child of God. Keep my head up. Facing him, I'm a child of God. Bless you all. Have a great week. Do stick around for a coffee, tea, whatever, and uh, meet with the guys coming in. And see you at six o'clock tonight, some of you, hopefully. God bless.